Is there an evolutionary explanation for any of this? I mean, I, I don't know if aesthetics, if you think about this through an evolutionary lens, but I mean, historically, we didn't need to look good beyond our 20s if looking, if the purpose of looking good was to attract a mate. So again, none of us yeah. sitting around this table need to look good in Darwinian terms because we're not reproducing. Do you think that factors into any of these observations? A hundred percent, yes. And so I, I think it's also good uh, for the sake of um, the overall podcast for us to talk about the evolutionary aspects of beauty for just a moment, which could be a whole separate podcast. You could invite Nancy Etkoff from Harvard to come talk to you about the psychology of beauty. She wrote the definitive book on it um, and summarizes all of um, evolutionary beauty science. I have all of my fellows read her book because I think it, it's just a, a beautiful compendium. And um, evolution, ev the evolution of beauty is a fascinating topic because when you think back to the evolution of humans, you know, why do we even care about beauty? And so the interesting fact is that we're actually genetically hardwired to appreciate beauty. Um, and so there's this famous study from the University of Texas in the 1980s, Judith Langlaw um, is sort of a, a well-known name in psychology. She did what's called a preferential looking study of infants. I don't know if you've heard of this study, but no. it's fascinating. She took newborn infants who were literally weeks old, barely able to see, um, you know, six inches away from their face. And she showed them pictures that are considered beautiful, faces of, that are beautiful, and faces that are less beautiful. And these newborn infants who have not yet been influenced by society preferentially were looking at the beautiful faces. And so that, that natural drive for us to appreciate beauty is present even at birth. Does that suggest that, be, that there is a definition of beauty that arcs time? Because I was actually going to ask a question, which would be a great you know, detour for us to take after this point about how much is the definition of beauty changing? In other words, if you took Matthew McConaughey and transported him back 10,000 years ago, would he still be a hunk is sort of where I was going. But continue with this point, and let's come back yeah, to I think that's the a, evolution. That's a beauty. great. Um, that's a great question, and I would say that the answer is generally yes. There's two layers here. The first layer is the genetic, biologic um, drive that we have to appreciate beauty in men and women, um, and then of course there is a societal impact that conditions us to appreciate certain versions of that beauty. But the fundamentals are uh, have been studied in the 90s. Um, and the fundamentals are that all humans across ethnicities all over the world have been studied, and they appreciate certain features of beauty. So there's symmetry of the face, um, facial proportion, and then um, they also appreciate uh, sexual dimorphisms. So those are kind of the three categories. And so um, symmetry, when, when a face is symmetric, it sort of connotes if you're out there in the reproductive world looking at the pool of your options, symmetry means that this individual most likely has had good development and nourishment and is most likely going to have good genetics for me to potentially connect with and pass on genetics together with. Um, facial proportion is similar. Um, in fact, um, to, to go a little deeper into that, um, averageness is really what people are looking for. And that doesn't, on the surface, that doesn't sound so attractive to be average. But if you take 100 faces of men, 100 faces of women, and average them all down to a single composite, you will... Um, average someone who has a little bit of a big nose or a small jaw or some aspect of their their forehead shape and all that gets averaged down into a composite that is considered universally beautiful across cultures and again that sort of unconsciously in the mating pool from an evolutionary standpoint is connoting healthy genetics um, again, to be able to pass on gen uh, your, your genetics with. And then the third area, which is sexual di dimorphism, we're talking here about strong jaws and med, full lips or big eyes in women. These tend to connote either higher estrogen levels or higher testosterone levels, depending on whether you're looking at women or men. And again, that's fertility. That's subconscious communication of fertility. So those are the genetic absolutes that exist in 
all of us on the planet. And then on top of that, as you're um, kind of bringing up, you know, social media, you know, in this culture, this particular way of, you know, uh, wearing your hair is considered beautiful. Those are conditioned upon us yep. based on society. Um, but it overlaps on top of that that underlying genetic basis. And how much have. can those things override? Again, I'll just use examples that we can all appreciate. Like, you know, my, my, I was talking with my daughter about Cindy Crawford. We were, you know, going, and I was like, look, like, look at a picture of Cindy today. Look at a picture of Cindy in the mid 1990s. I mean, there's simply no way to describe beauty in any other way. Like, you, you, it doesn't matter what your type is everybody would acknowledge Cindy is absurdly beautiful. And so you're saying she is hitting it out of the park on those three things, independent of what the in vogue look of the moment is, right? So if, if, if it becomes the case that blondes are really attractive, it doesn't matter. Like Cindy will override that. If it becomes the thing that women who weigh 30 pounds are attractive, it doesn't matter. Cindy will override that. Is yeah, I that think kind of what look, you're saying? If you look at even different races, and yes. look at a beautiful person in each of those, they actually all have similar measurements. So there are these masks that you can superimpose onto any image and really dissect down every single angle, whether it's the cheek angle, the jawline angle, the shape of the nose, the eyes. And all of you, if you look at that across different races, they all have that same kind of measurement that they hit. Talking about those same, the symmetry, the upper third, the middle third, lower third, the face, the fifths going across the face. All of that, if you look at a beautiful person, no matter what race they are, they all kind of hit those measurements. Now, then there are nuances. Like you said, you change your hair, you change your makeup, you can transform yourself. But if you take someone without makeup and just look at them that way, they all kind of conform to those measurements. Doesn't this apply, imply that over time, beauty should be one of the most preserved, concentrated traits of our evolution, given the presumably the difficulty in acquiring a mate absent beauty? In other words, does it suggest that if you compared what we as a population look like today in 2025 to what we looked like 2,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, are we monotonically getting more attractive as a species? Can I jump in on one thing on this? Mm -hmm. uh, you would think so, right? Because we're selectively- Because the selection yes, should be ramping it up. Exactly. So we should be marrying someone that looks better or mating with someone that looks better and having our progeny look better. But what's different is our diet. So take, go back 100 years, 200 years, 1,000 years, we had to chew a lot more mm. to really digest our food. We were working our masseters. We were working our jawline. Our palates were not as high. Our jawline was a lot wider. Our teeth were stronger. And then as we have changed our diet and everything is cooked and we don't have to make as much effort to chew it, you actually get more crowding in your of your teeth. Your jawline is a little bit less strong. Your palate changes. More people become nose breathe, uh, mouth breathers as opposed to nose breathers. That changes the shape of your face. And that has been measured anthropologically. And so it's interesting because there's a whole book on hmm. breath. And they go through the anthropology of all of that and the changes in the skeletons that they've gone back and studied. And so that does fundamentally change. Now we have kids that have to have teeth extracted or we have to have palate expanders now because we realize when we extracted teeth before, we made the faces more narrow. And so now the thinking is let's preserve the teeth, expand the palate when the child is 10, allow those teeth to come in so there's less grinding, uh, I'm sorry, crowding. And then that face will be better and a uh, stronger jawline. So it is something that we've changed. And then just to kind of uh, head into the area of sociology for just a moment, uh, 10,000 years ago, um, if you were born in some place on earth, Peter, your the pool, the genetic pool that you'd be interacting with yeah, tiny. was tiny. You know, uh, there's some um, f uh, f uh, fact that I'm probably going to misstate, but somewhere around 1900, most people on this planet had not moved within 10 miles of where they were born. And now it's totally different. And with social media and the way that we can connect with people around the world, not only because we can fly all around the world, but we're also seeing people on screens. The 
the the apparent genetic pool of faces that we're looking at has in has exponentially blown up into this very strange world Such that we're living point. in in 2025 yep. compared to where our evolutionary biology has taken us. And I wonder also at what point in our development did other, um, I don't want to say higher order, but other things became priorities in finding a mate. Like I think for most, all of us, I think when we were looking for our mate, appearance was probably not the top of the list. It was one of the factors you had to be attracted to the person, but I, I would guess for all of us, it was, will this person be a great spouse? Will this person be a great parent? Does this person share my goals and values and blah, 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 blah. It's hard to imagine our ancestors were, were, had the luxury of maybe thinking about those things. So, so yeah, all of this is to say it's way more complex today. Um, but it is, it is just as to hear you guys describe this, it's entirely fascinating to play the thought experiment of transport a hyper attractive person today back in time, 10,000 years. And I would just be so curious as to how they would react to that individual. I think it's a fascinating thought experiment. And I think that if they meet those criteria that we're, we're yep. defining, they would be considered a hunk or a beauty. Yeah. And then w one last thing, and then we can certainly move on to the next topic. But um, in terms of timing, it, it is important for us to be evolutionarily attractive, historically, not in the modern era, until you're about 20 or 25, because we weren't supposed to live this long. One of the um, issues that comes up with longevity and and trying to maximize our health span is that we were not really supposed to be living this long and healthy this long. And so evolutionarily, you know, Mother Nature is not helping us with our appearance. Our appearance was supposed to carry us through until about 20 or 25, at which point, you know, your kids are old, you know, most people were pro procreating at 14. And then at 25, their kids were at the point where they were getting ready to procreate. And then, you know, you're let off to let, let out to pasture at that point, basically. <laughs> so, so evolutionarily, what we do every day um, with our patients is we're really fighting biology. We're fighting genetics. We're fighting the environment. an unnatural yep. existence that we have as a luxury of being born in this era. I'm Peter Atia. This podcast relies exclusively on premium subscribers for support, which allows us to provide all our content without taking a single penny from advertisers. I believe this keeps my content honest, making it a trusted resource for listeners like you. As a premium member, you'll get immediate access to our entire back catalog of AMA episodes and all future AMA episodes. You'll get longevity-focused premium articles packed with actionable insights, You'll get unrivaled show notes for each and every episode of The Drive, every topic, every study, every resource from each episode carefully curated for you. You'll get quarterly podcast summaries where you'll learn my biggest personal takeaways from the previous 90 days of expert guest episodes and much more. This journey doesn't have to be navigated alone. We can take these steps towards a better, longer life together. Become a premium member today at peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe to join me in a shared commitment to a healthier future. Uh -huh.